Glad to see so many here. When you, when you say he is risen, we understand who he is. And the focal point of who we worship is God. And as we look at how God has intersected with our lives, we see a very clear intersection when we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what a glorious um, gift that God has given us. When I was in engineering school, there used to be tests, unlike tests that you would take maybe in some other maybe courses, and there would be like two or three questions on the exam. That's it. You'd get your test and they'd have a question on page 11 by 14, the big long ones. And there'd be three of them. You'd look them over, look at that one, don't know that one, don't know that one. I'm going to start here. And then these questions would be like this. It'd be really long questions like, you have a hinged door up here, and there's a stick there, and the coefficient of friction is near, and da 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 Find the force at which such and such would do this. And then you would have to calculate and do a bunch of stuff. And they would give you a bunch of information on the exam over in the corner, like the density of water is 62.4 pounds per square f for, per cubic foot, or the gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, or the sun comes up once a day, or some other nebulous information that is kind of like, not really going to be a part of your solution, but you have to pick and choose what's helpful and what's not. And so, you know, a lot of times when you're clueless, what do you do? You're confused and you just say, well, I'm just going to have to grab 62.4 and just put it in a few, you know, put in a few calculations and hopefully just pray for some extra credit or some partial credit. And that's kind of what it looked like. And there was a lot of confusion as you would leave the exam and we would kind of, we'd kind of pile together almost like a little huddle and, hey, what did you do for that one? I had no clue with that one. What was that about? And we would kind of compare. But the, the take home was is there was a lot of confusion and a lot of confusion because of the extra information that was given that wasn't even pertinent to the problem at all. It was a distraction. And today, we want to look and we want to shed away the distractions, and we want to look at what the real issue is, because there's so much confusion out there. There's so much confusion about even what you believe. I went to a, a course last week, and it was a four-day course, and on the way there, it was to Hamilton, Montana, and on the way there, the gentleman, really great guy, who I work with, said, so he knows I'm a pastor, he says, so what do you believe? So what, what, what do you guys believe? And uh, for the next five hours, we spent five hours, no less than five hours, talking about this. And I let him lead, and, and, just, and I just answered the questions. And the confusion that he had in his mind was so great. He just couldn't understand from what he had heard, little bits and pieces, what this whole thing was about. What's Christianity really about? What does it mean? When you, get a, when you take away all the stuff that's not helpful to understanding it, the 62.4s and the extraneous information, what really does Easter come down to? Well, there was a lot of confusion then as there is now. As we skip ahead to the Gospel of John, the, the young man who stood at the cross, and Jesus said, this is your son, Mary, and Mary this, and, and said to him, that you're going to take care of her. As John writes, that perspective comes in. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the, the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed, and they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And the reason they didn't understand was there was a lot of extraneous information that they hadn't put into perspective. And today my prayer is that that happens for you, that you have a very clear understanding of what it is that you believe 
or what it is that you maybe came this morning to understand, maybe for the first time, or maybe you're just checking things out. That is great. We're, we all start there. What is it that we need to understand about Christianity? It's this one thing. We have one mantra. He is risen. He is risen. Everything that I believe hinges on this one basic fact. It's the one thing that has to be on the exam for me to fill out anything else because if this didn't happen, everything else doesn't make sense. And it didn't happen. This is the hinge point. It is the cornerstone of the whole, uh, the whole new church as we see a first century church explode. Jesus is alive. Well, the problem is, is that mo- many don't believe in Jesus they don't believe in the resurrection, and they're just trying to figure out all this, all this information that may be extraneous. And some of the information that's there is just not very helpful because some people will say, he was just a teacher. He was just a good guy. He was a prophet, much like someone else. Um, and when you look at him from that perspective and you see all that confusing information, it does make sense that people can't figure out what Christianity is really about. And it really is upon us to be able to explain to the person who sits beside you for five hours on your next trip to work, or the person that sits beside you in the truck at work or in the cubicle next to you, or the neighbor who you help clean his yard every year, and they say, so what's that? What's the deal with church? Do you have a clear answer? Can you explain it? It's really important that we can, because we are to be the voice that carries the gospel, the good news, to a world that needs him so badly. And there's a, there's a, an issue, and the issue is this. Jesus made a claim. I want you to kind of just be a little bit, uh, I guess it will back up just a bit. Today I want you to serve as if and on a jury. Okay, just picture yourself, you're in a jury. We have a big jury today. This would be a huge one. But I want you to think of yourself as someone who's on the jury who has to make, at the end of the day, a verdict. And you have to substantiate the evidence given, and you have to make this plausible. Is this reasonable or not? Beyond a reasonable doubt, what's going on? And as we look at this jury duty that you're on, what is it that would convince you that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was to come? He made a claim. He didn't commit a crime. And yet he was killed. What claim was it that he, he made? One claim, and it was what? He was God. Corey's going to get a Snickers, make, pass it on. Good catch. I'm God, John 10.30. I and the Father are one. And they picked up stones to kill him, 10.33. And if they, didn't, if they, they could not have picked up stones and killed him if he was not clear. What was the due penalty for claiming that you were God? You could get stoned. That is a very clear determination that what he said was, I'm God. I am, I am. And then he went on to explain to him, you know what? In three days, this temple, is gonna, we're going to go in the ground and we're going to come back out. And they didn't understand it. They thought he was talking about a, another temple. This risen Savior is either the cornerstone of what we believe or, de- believe, or he destroys everything we believe. All on one thing, his claim. And he made one claim. And that claim either makes him a liar or it makes him a savior. And you're on the jury duty and you need to figure all that out. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul says, if Christ is not raised, our faith is worthless. You can quit coming to church. Wouldn't that be great if you could just say, you know what, I got freed up for three more hours every week on Sunday morning. I'm going to go hunting, fishing, whatever it is. But I'm not letting you off the jury stand just yet, okay? You're not there yet. Because if this is true... Hunting and fishing has such little value in comparison to an eternal Savior. Now, I say that with a little bit of guardedness because some of you love hunting very much. (laughs) So, an empty tomb, eyewitnesses, and the early church explosion are three good reasons why I want you to consider who Jesus was, and then we're going to get to what that means to you. They had professional execute. These guys were not just some guys. They said, hey, go execute him. They did this for a living. They were good at it, and it seems to be that they probably enjoyed it a little bit as well. And so as we look at the executioners, we see, wow, here it is. There's, there was also, in, in that tradition, a minimum of seven trained coroners would confirm the death because this was a deterrent 
deterrent. The penalty for sin and the, the uh, crucifixion was a deterrent to would-be criminals. He was placed in the tomb with a two-ton stone. The Praetorian forces, there have been 16 Praetorian forces. These guys were Rambos. They were trained to, to defend a certain area against a whole brigade, which is a lot of people, 100 people. So these were just not average soldiers. They were guarding the tomb. And then the question here is, what did the women see in John 20? They looked in the tomb. Mary Magdalene looked in the tomb, and what did she see? She saw the linens lying there, and what? The headdress separately, as if it was placed there. Something was going on supernatural. So the questions and some of the ideas that are floating around out there, maybe the disciples took the body. It's a, good, it's a good explanation. If they took the body and they hid it, then they can make up the story that maybe Jesus rose and we can become famous and rich and all that kind of stuff. But the evidence is against that because if they were to overtake these fighting men and they were to do all that, the, in the end what happens is they have to die for something they made up. Not plausible, jury. Not plausible. As we see how those men died, you would just imagine yourself. You know what? It's a lot easier to say it was all something we made up. We got together. It was kind of a fun thing, uh, but it wasn't true. And spare your own life. How about the Jewish reli religious leaders taking the body? Makes sense that maybe they would take the body, but it doesn't because the Christian church exploded. And the reason it exploded was because they were running around saying three words He is risen. He is risen. And if they would have had the body, those Jewish leaders would have drug it out and said, he's not risen, here he is. And it would have been so easy to kill Christianity right at the very, very beginning, and we would not be here today if that was the truth. It's not a plausible theory. It's not a plausible theory. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding kind of what is true and what's not true. There's a cool story of a burglar who broke into a home and, he, and was looking around, and he heard a soft voice saying, Jesus is watching you. Thinking it was just his imagination, he continued his search for whatever he was burglarizing. Again, the voice said, Jesus is watching you. He turned his flashlight around and saw a parrot in a cage. And I'm picturing ja Jackie and Troy's house for some reason. He asked the parrot if he, has, if, if, he was one of the, if he was the one talking, and the parrot said, yes. He asked the parrot what his name was, and the parrot said, Moses. The burglar asked, what kind of people would name a parrot Moses? And the parrot said, well, the same kind of people who would name their pit bull Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we have to decide who it is that we're talking about. And as we look at the evidence, we realize that Jesus truly is the centerpiece of everything. And he's watching this whole scenario unravel as people... We're trying to explain, where did his body go? But he showed himself. There were eyewitnesses. Many of them saw him with their own eyes. More than 500 people saw Jesus with their own eyes. And they were together. You know, you and I might think we saw a deer run across the road or there was an elk over there or something. Two of us might. But if you had 500 people who not only saw him, but ate with him and drank with him and spent time with him after you would have a, confirming, a confirmation that that really occurred. And over 500 witnesses to the, the, not only the resurrection to his existence, but also what he did after the time that he came back, the 40 days he spent here, um, is a confirming witness to what happened, that Jesus truly did live. After his suffering, suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And I'm sure they were just like, could you, tell, could you show us something, Jesus? Just show us that you're real. Like, you're, move that piece of bread or something like that. You can just imagine how they were just enamored with the fact that he's truly here. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He not just appeared, he taught them. How'd they get to know all those things? They were running, they were cowards at the cross. Remember, John was the only one that even hung around. Peter denied him three times. And from, by the time that that's all over with, they're coming out and preaching and acts, and, the, and the, the rulers are saying, if you do this again, we're going to kill you. And what do they do? They did it again. Why? What was the change of mind? It was something they saw. It wasn't something that they say they believed. It was something that they saw. 
1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6, Paul writes this, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And they could have confirmed, the living witnesses could have cons- confirmed or denied exactly what was going on. No one is denying it because they were all there. They all saw the same thing. Acts 2.32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to to their number that day. Why so many? Why didn't they believe before? At the cross, they ran away, and the disciples just dispersed. Now we have 3,000 coming to Christ in one day. Do you know what those 3,000 people, why they came to Christ? Because the people who saw Jesus resurrected said, you got to come and listen to what Peter says. you got to come. And those maybe 500 or more witnesses told their people, and pretty soon there was a convincing, a convincing witness pool that could say to those people who they knew, this is true, this is, all, this is all true. And that was what God did as the witnesses came forward. The transformed lives of the early church is another reason. So we have the empty tomb, and we have this early, this, uh, early church um, explosion, but also um, the idea that there are eyewitnesses. But the transformed lives of the early church is huge. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear, they were very fearful, the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood, stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And from that day on, they lived a different life than they did before. They were no longer fearful because of what they saw, not what they believed. Many people will say, yeah, there are a lot of people who die for their religion, their cause. But they try to understand the difference. They're dying for a creed. Something that they say, yeah, I believe so much in this, these ide- ideals that I'm going to die for it. But it's very different to die for what you saw. What you eyewit- what your eyewitness. That this was either true or false. No, it was true. I was there. And you can argue until you want to. I was there. I know. You've heard that before. That's how determined they were. It all hinges on what happened and what they saw. Well, here's what happened to the disciples. And all the, any of the disciples would have had to do at any point in time to recant would just be, you know what, he didn't rise, we made it all up, it's just a big hoax, but they didn't. Just kind of just get the gravity of, of how these disciples who Jesus saw, or Jesus taught, and who uh, they saw him die and rise again. Matthew was beheaded in Ethiopia. That's Levi, the tax collector. Mark was dragged through the streets until he was dead. Peter, Simon, Andrew, and Philip were all crucified. James was beheaded. Bartholomew was flayed and then crucified. Thomas was pierced with lances, actually some sticks. James the Lesser was thrown from the temple and stoned to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows, and Paul was beheaded in Rome under Nero. Whoa! All of them could have said, it's a lie. We made it up. It's just a big hoax. And you look at their lives and you go, wow, they believe what they saw. They believed what happened to them. And so the evidence is really clear. And I, now I have to ask you, because you're on the, you're in the jury stand, what's your verdict? What's your verdict? There's the empty tomb, there are eyewitnesses, and there's the transformed lives of the early church. And those things are irrefutable. There's really no explanation for why, they would, why it would happen that way. And the proof of, proof of the resurrection is so important that we hinge our whole belief system on it. Think of it this way. This is kind of an inductive approach. If the resurrection is true, then Jesus is God. Would you agree with me? You're in church, so you're going to have to agree with me, okay? All right. Kind of a, kind of a, so if, if the resurrection is true, he was God. And if he is God and he said, my words will never pass away, and, he's, and he confirmed the scriptures, then we know the scriptures are true too. So the resurrection actually confirms the Bible that you read. 
It's true. And that is the basis for everything we believe. Some people say, I don't believe the Bible. And I just say, you know what? I believe in the resurrection, therefore I believe in the Bible. The resurrection is a historically documented uh, event that occurred, and everything is hinged from it. Charles Spurgeon, the <coughs> British pre preacher, said this, I would recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or else not believe at all. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. You need to either believe it to the hilt or don't believe it at all. Because where are you going to start picking and choosing? Really? What fits your lifestyle? What fits your belief system? Spurgeon says, no, it isn't that way. We need to believe it completely or not believe it at all. The resurrection gives us hope. How do you know that your prayers will be answered? Because there's a resurrected Lord. How do you know that you're going to receive comfort when you're in trouble and you have no one else to go to because of the risen Savior? How do you know that you can trust the Bible and the promises and the promises of eternal life and that, you're, that your salvation is secure because of the risen Savior? Everything hinges on this one thing. And I didn't understand that at the beginning. I was kind of just, this Christianity thing is new, even though I'd gone to church for a long time, but no one had ever explained to me, this, res this resurrection is historically documented. There's so much information on it. Two books I read in the early part of my Christian walk was Evidence Demands a Verdict One, and it was a big, kind of a textbook-looking look, thing. And all these secular resources that just talked about Jesus and, this, and the way and, and confirmed all of these things in archaeology and history and all that. And then volume two, and I thought to myself, oh, I've got it all figured out. And then another question, and another question, and another question. And pretty soon, at some point in time, you realize the resurrection is how we are confirmed in our faith because all the other peripheral stuff really isn't essential. If this one thing happened, it's all true. It's all true or none of it's true. And so why is the resurrection, resurrection so important? Well, maybe you could ask Pete and Tobin's family. Because if Christ was not raised, who would ever think that I would be raised or that Tobin would be, would be raised? The resurrection is what our whole hope rests on. If he was not raised, neither would we be. And the, having the confidence that she's in heaven with her Savior and has no pain or weakness and has none, none of the physical problems that she went through, we owe to our risen Savior who provided that hope to us too. Where are you going to go when the end of your life comes? That comfort comes from a clear understanding that Jesus went so that we could be also guaranteed that we would be risen When Rod came home yesterday on the plane and John was flying in, it's just a really cool thing. And, you know, he's flying in and, and we're all waiting for him and we're all just excited. Everyone's just excited and his plane shows up and then it's taxiing and you can't wait till he gets out. And uh, Rod Schmidt, he comes out of there and I'm sure he's just like, wow, you guys all, I just expected to go home and get a good cup of coffee and, you know, get in my own bed and all that. And here we are just as excited as could be. And it just made me think, you know, flip forward 50, 60 years, sometime when I show up in heaven, who's going to be there? What kind of a party is going to be waiting for me? I picture my dad, I picture my mom, I picture the people who have gone before me, my family, the people who are in the church family. They're just going to be waiting, oh man, you're here. You're, we've, been, we've been having a great time and we've been waiting for you. It's going to be, it is going to be a reunion that you can't imagine because of the risen Savior, because of what he did for us. When C.S. Lewis lost his friend Charles Williams, he wrote something which he said he thought he would never write. He was kind of a matter-of-fact type of guy, had some great writings. It sounded like so much sentimental drivel, he said. He wrote that since Charles had died, heaven was no longer a strange, far-off place. Why? Because now his friend was there. Later, Lewis's beloved wife, Joy, died. And he said the same thing. Heaven was closer still because joy was there. Separation is difficult for us who remain in the flesh, but it's difficult, it is difficult because of who we love. There's a separation, but the good news is there's a reunion. And at some point in time, for those of us who have received Christ, we're going to be received into this big reunion, this, 
this following that, as you think of the great cloud of witnesses that Hebrew talks about, that they'll be waiting for us and that there will be a reception because they miss us as we miss them. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul continues, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, Adam and Christ. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Those who trust in Christ, those who have him as their Savior and their Lord, do not fear death. Yeah, it's scary, but we know where we're going to go. There's a reunion waiting for us there. It's going to be an awesome time. So what do you do with your sin and your guilt and all of those things that weigh us down here? Well, I don't know where you're at this morning. You may have just showed up because someone else said, hey, it's, it's Easter, you better, you better show up. We, and I'm going to bring you to church. And that's okay because they love you. That's, that's, they love you. They care about you. But what do you do with your sin and your guilt and the punishment that would come with that as we look at the Easter message, what great news it is. And just like on the engineering exam, there's just a few questions, but at the end of this slide, there's only going to be one question on the final exam. That one question is this, do you believe, do you believe this? In John 11:25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the key, key question. Do you believe this? Do you believe Jesus is risen? Do you, you're sitting on the jury stand right now, and you are, you are asked to give a verdict. What's your verdict? And I'm not going to have you raise your right hand and your left hand, but I want you to do this in your head. Do I believe that Jesus was rose from the dead, that God accepted his payment. What's kind of cool is you think of it as God loved us so much that he wrote us this huge check on Friday, and he put his son to pay for our sin. And how do we know whether that was accepted? How do we know whether the check cleared? On Sunday morning, God said, enough of the punishment. It is finished. It is done. And he received his son as a perfect payment for my sin, and for whoever receives that perfect gift that God has given as a generous thing that a God would, who is all holy and who has to deal with sin gives the perfect gift that makes the sin washed away. Do you believe this is the final question on the exam? And every one of us that leaves today has to make that, has to make that verdict. And as I often do, I'm going to go through the ABCs of salvation. Maybe you've never understood, just like the guy who I rode to work uh, to, to Hamilton with, said, so what do you believe? And at the end of our conversation, I said, it's just really simple. You just need to admit that you have sinned, that you have done things that are wrong. He's like, no problem there. You know, he kind of starts listening a few things. I'm like, it's fine. You don't have to go on. You know, kind of, we just talked about a few things and, we, and, and just kind of discussed them. And then I said, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for those sins, to pay for those sins, because death pays for sin in God's economy. And he was, he was like, wow, I, you know, that's just, it's such a big thing. Why would he do that? And then I said, you, need to, you just need to choose. Choose to receive that free gift. And I explained to him that that check was just sitting out there, and God is like, please take it, please take it. I want to pay for your sin. For each one of you today, God holds out a check, and he says, and if you haven't received it, I want you to receive this check. And do you know what he said at the end of it? He goes, one question. It's kind of the answer to this one. So why wouldn't anyone want to receive that free gift? And I said, I don't know. It's too good to be true. And he goes, it is too good to be true. I said, it's too good to be true because God is too good to be true. God loves us so much. That's why. And if your understanding of who God is is anything different from that, you've been sold a bunch of extraneous information. That is wrong. There is one thing we need to understand and to embrace and make a choice about. Is Jesus risen from my sins? And did he, did he die on the cross for them or not? And if he has, I want you to pray that right now as I just lead you through an example prayer. I want everyone to pray it. You may have prayed this 15,000 times. That's cool. You give thanks to God if you've already prayed it. But if you've prayed this for the very first time, if it's heartfelt and you really wanted to receive the gift, this is your time to receive it in a simple prayer to him. Dear God, 
you know, you're gonna you're gonna go with me now here. Yeah, this is a this is like karaoke all play, okay? Everybody has to say things. All right, dear God, I admit I'm a sinner in need of you. Please forgive me of my sins and give me abundant life here on earth and eternal life with you in heaven. I believe Jesus died and rose again for my sins. I choose to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're just going to continue. God, thank you so much for your son. Thank you that he is risen. Thank you that you accepted his payment for the sin that I committed, that we so much can't pay for ourselves. Thank you that it's too good to be true. It just seems that way. It seems like, how can it, can't I do something? Can't I work? And yet we can, because you have made it so, so sufficient. Your son's death on the cross is sufficient for my sin. Thank you for my, for my guarantee of resurrection, that I too will be resurrected because you were resurrected. Thank you for those who have gone before me. Lord, I look forward to that reunion because of who we've loved and because who love us and because of the fact that we'll spend eternity with you forever and ever and ever, forever. What is that? one amazing thing. That is a long time. Thank you, Lord, that I have that to look forward to. And we pray this in your blessed Son's name who died on the cross for us. Amen. Amen.